All right, let's look at a retirement strategy for a 50 year old with $500,000 saved for retirement. He's asking the question, hey, when can I retire? And when can I retire? And what about taxes? And what about claiming social security benefits? And what about the market? How should I be invested? That's what we're going to look at today on the Your Financial EKG YouTube channel. We're going to go through a scenario for a 50 year old with $500,000 saved for retirement, asking the question, when can I retire and am I on track? Because we want to get you to retirement, we want to get you through retirement, and we want to protect your ability to stay in retirement. So let's look at this. This is Jack Foster. This is his scenario. So Jack is 50 years old and five months. He's got a birthday in August, August 15th, he'll be 51. His current salary is about $110,000 per year. Now he is a plumber, he's self-employed, so his income does fluctuate up and down depending on how many toilets he unclogs. And so we've averaged it out over the last five years. It's about, about $110,000 for the last five years. I hope it's more than that but we're just gonna look at it at $110,000. And we're gonna show a projected annual salary increase of 1%. So we're gonna show more people clogging up more toilets and needing Jack for work, all right? Now we're gonna look at a projected retirement date of January of 2033. So it'll be 60 years and five months at that point. So we're looking at a 60 year old, 10 years from now, retirement date okay so we've got 10 years to build up our retirement assets our retirement savings our retirement income portfolio to make sure that we've got enough money for retirement income and to last throughout our retirement the first thing that we're going to look at with jack okay social security this is a big thing so we're looking at jack taking it at 67 that would be his full retirement age he was born after 1960 so he's his full retirement age is 67 years old twenty eight hundred dollars is his gross monthly benefit at 67. now he's self-employed and so his social security benefit is less for someone who's made a hundred thousand dollars a year for a lot of his career but the reason for that is he's got a lot of business expenses that go on top of that so twenty eight hundred dollars is what he's going to get for social security at 67. we need to look at this again jack's single now he's divorced okay he has two children and so as a single guy he needs to look at Social Security like an income payment, like an annuity income payment. We need to try to maximize his Social Security because it's on me, myself, and I, right? There's no other assets that are going to come in to Jack's life. There's no other plan that's going to be added in as an influx of retirement savings. And so for him, as a single guy, we want to try to maximize his Social Security because it's guaranteed, backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, and has a COLA increase on it for the rest of his life. So $2,800 is what it would be at 67. Now, now let, me, let me show you this real quick, because I think this is really imperative that you understand exactly what Social Security looks like. So let's think about Jack for a minute. So we've got Jack, and he's 50, okay? Now, if he takes Social Security at 62, he's gonna get 70% of his full retirement benefit. So he'd only get 70% of his full retirement benefit. Remember, his full retirement benefit is 2,800. So at 62, he's only gonna get $1,960. Now at 67, he would get 100%, which is the 2,800, okay? And then at 70, we're able to add in another 840, I'm sorry, he's got 124% of his full retirement benefit at 70. So now we're able to add in basically another 30%, which would be 3,472. So at 70, he's going to get 124% of his full retirement benefit. So as a single guy, we look at this and I say, Gosh, Jack, if we could get $3,400 per month for the rest of your life at 70, 20 years from now, that would be really good because we know that this is going to get a COLA increase between 50 and 70. And we know that once you turn this on at 70, it's going to get a COLA increase for the next 15 and 20 years. 
That's a lot of money that you're leaving on the table if you take it too soon. But the question becomes, can our assets support taking Social Security here? Because if we retire at 60 and our retirement assets can't support that, we might have to take Social Security here to give our retirement assets a break. We gotta plug the gap so that our retirement income will, go, will come from somewhere and be able to last forever. So that's what we're gonna look at. What's gonna make the most sense for Jack, okay? So let's go back to the plan. Now, we go to assets. So Jack has just a few assets. He's got money in the bank, $50,000. Okay, he's got a good money, he got a good hedge in the bank. At TD Ameritrade, we manage money for Jack at TD Ameritrade. He has a SEP IRA. In his SEP, he has $375,000, of which he's putting about $1,500 a month into his SEP IRA. That's 25% of his salary, okay? So with a SEP IRA, you can put in 25%, up to 25% of your salary, or like $67,000, and that changes every year, okay? So he's putting in 25% of his salary, $1,500. He also has a TD Ameritrade Freedom Fund, which is a non-qualified brokerage account of 75,000, where he's putting in $250 a month. So all total, he's putting about 1750 per month into the market. Okay, so we want to see projected out how much will you have at retirement putting in $1,750 and getting a rate of return from the overall market. Now, Jack's primary residence is $375,000 and it is paid off. He doesn't have any debt. So the reason he has less save for retirement now because he paid a lot onto his house to get that paid off. So we have a $375,000 home that's paid off but that can be used for an asset in the future. I did not mention Jack lives in Montana. And so, you know, if he wants to move to Florida, he could, Texas, he could, but he's in a lower cost area of Montana. And so his house, even though it's paid off, is not necessarily a asset where he could sell it and move to another low cost area of the country. So this is gonna be, it needs to be used as an influx into his retirement plan in the, in the way of maybe a reverse mortgage uh, would be if, if, if need be, okay? So from a rate of return standpoint, we're gonna earn 6% before retirement and we're gonna earn 4% after retirement. All we're trying to do is to just kind of downshift his risk as we go, right? So right now at 50, we're still trying to earn as much as we possibly can. It's all about capital appreciation. But the closer we get to age 60, it becomes more about capital preservation because eventually it's gonna become distribution, right? We're gonna distribute his assets. House is gonna earn a 1% rate of return. Any cash flows or RMDs are at six and four. Okay, so his overall rate of return is five and a half percent until he gets to retirement. So at 60, his rate of return is gonna be 4% from 60 to 100. So for all of you who comment and say, the market's not gonna make 6% for the next decade, here's 4% for you, okay? We're gonna downshift to four. Now, current risk classification, 85, whoa, not 85%, go back up here. This is at risk, perfect, there we go. Current risk classification, 90% of his money is at risk, which means it's in the market, okay? And 10% is in the bank. Taxes, this is bigger. 75% of his money is qualified, meaning there will be taxes that need to be paid on this. So the question becomes on this money, do we wanna do some Roth conversions? What's that look like? How can we get more money into the Freedom Fund or into a Roth IRA so there's less taxes in the future? What we wanna look at from a tax standpoint is, he's putting this $1,500 in for taxes every year. Now he's self-employed, so he's putting money away as a deduction for his business taxes as well. He's trying to get his, you know, he's, he's, he's basically trying to get his tax bill as low as possible. It's just him, he's a solo guy, solo entrepreneur, so there's not any employees, there's no solo 401ks or 401ks, so he has a SEP, he's trying to bring his income down as much as possible, the deduction does that. So we need to look at what his taxes are gonna be, and if we adjust this distribution, can we put more money into the brokerage account, eliminate the SEP contribution, so that there's less taxable income in the future, 
or is it better to continue to do the SEP deposit to bring the taxes down now, okay? So that's something we really need to get a handle on. Now, from an expense standpoint, his expenses are $3,500 a month, very low expenses. Again, he has no debt, he's a single guy, the kids are grown, he lives in Montana, okay? $3,500. Cash flows, Jack likes to fish. So his annual fishing trip costs about $3,000. He stays local in the, in the Midwest area. So he wants to do a fishing trip every year of about $3,000. Okay, so from 2023 to 2048 with, a, with an increase on this. So we need to go in here. I don't know if I put an inflation increase. I didn't. Let's put a 2.5% inflation increase on this. So his fishing trip is going to get a 2.5% increase every year. $3,000, 2.5% because he likes to fish. So we wanted to add that in. So here's taxes. So let's look at this. So let's go to 2024. So in the year 2024, his tax rate is basically 14%. That's his projected federal tax rate. So you can see it over here. Here's his wages. So that's his gross income. There's his qualified contributions. There's the 18,000 that we're putting into the SEP IRA. Here's his 1099 interest from the bank. And then here's any kind of taxable withdrawals. That's that he took out that money for the fishing trip, okay? So his gross income, $96,669. There's our deduction, single person deduction, $13,850. Remember, if he's married, it's 27, but he's single, so it's $13,850. So our taxable income is $82,819, all right? Which puts him in the 22% bracket, but after all the deductions and credits, he's in the 14% bracket. Now. Take a look at this. Remember that number, 14%. Let's go back to assets real quick. Remember he's putting 1,500 into his SEP and 250 into his Freedom Fund. What if we flip that? What if we took 1,500 and put that into the Freedom Fund, right? And 250 into the SEP. So we're at 14%. Let's go back to taxes. Look what it does. It bumps us up 1%. So from 13.94 to 15.06. Remember 97,819, we were at 82, now we're at 97,819. Remember we $18,000 in qualified contributions, now we only have three. So it's something I can go back to Jack on and say, hey Jack, if we adjust your contribution from the SEP to the brokerage account, your taxes will go up 1% now, okay? But in the future, you'll have less taxes because there'll be less money in the SEP. Do you want to do that? Okay, so that's a conversation we would have to have. Now let's go back and change it. Perfect. All right. So let's go to pre-retirement. This is where we're going to see, hey, how long is this going to last? So at 50, here's our gross monthly salary. There's our monthly contributions. You can see that 1,500 into the SEP, 250 into the into the Freedom Fund, $3,000. That's the fishing trip. We're going fishing. There's our net monthly income, 5,312. Net means taxes have come out of this. Net monthly expenses. So we have a positive cash flow of $1,700. Now, anytime you see green on the screen, what I'm going to do with the software is I'm going to take that positive green and we're going to put that into a brokerage account for Jack. So we're gonna to continue to build up that freedom fund. We wanna to continue to put money in there. Now, if he didn't have enough in his emergency fund, if he didn't have enough in maybe a savings account, we could build up those funds as well and then move it to the brokerage account. But because he has $50,000 in his savings account, which I feel is really good for where he's at, we can, we can repurpose that money into a brokerage account. So when you look at this, we're at $500,000 right now at 50. At 60, he'd have $1.1 million in retirement savings. So let's go to retirement and let's look at this. And you can probably already see it up here a little bit. Basically in the year 2055, we're out at 83, okay? He needs a rate of return needed to avoid a shortfall is 6.54%. Now remember at retirement, we're running this at four. So we're about two and a half percent off what he needs to make this money go to a hundred. But as a single guy, mortality rates at about 84, 85 for males, maybe we just look at pushing this another 10 years. Okay, so let's look at this. So we're at 60, here's our distributions. Here's 67 Social Security, 2800, which we talked about on the board. 
and here we are out of money at 83. So this is what I'll do with, I'll talk to Jack about it. I'll say, hey Jack, at about 75, 76, your house is worth $486,000. You could do a reverse mortgage at this point if you didn't want to leave the house to the kids. If you were not concerned about legacy with the house, you could leave, you could do a reverse mortgage. That would put an influx into the plan. Depending on where the real estate market is, you could sell the house and move into a smaller condo or something. Those two things, when I talked to Jack, were not necessarily, it did not get him excited, right? It didn't set his wood on fire. So I said, okay, well, we need to go back to the drawing board. Let's go back to Social Security first. Let's look at taking Social Security at 62. So let's get 70% 70 70 of your full retirement benefit. I know that's her heresy saying that, but let's look at it. What if we took it at 62 with some COLA increases? Here we go, 1960, it's a great year for music. So 1960, he's taking it at 62. Now remember, look at this. If he takes it at 63, 64, 65, 66, he's still gonna get an increase. 67 is the full retirement age, and 70 is where we're getting 124%. But let's just look at 62 real quick and see what happens. Go back to retirement. Look, we actually gained a year by taking it early. Why is that, Drew? Easy. We took Social Security early, right? So think about it from a bucket standpoint. We have this bucket of money, which is his Social Security. We have this bucket of money, which is his retirement assets. We're using this bucket for income. Well, he's 60. He needs a little bit more income than what the portfolio percentage can deliver. And so the retirement asset is slowly draining. So what we can do is we can start this Social Security bucket and stop the retirement asset bucket. And so now the drain is slower because we're using the two. It gives him an extra year. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a permanent fix, but it is a move in the right direction. So I say, okay, Jack, let's go back to Social Security. We looked at taking it so 62, 84. I still don't feel that great about that. Let's, let's see what we can do to get you into the 90s. So let's take Social Security at 67. I said, hey, Jack, why do you want to retire at 60? He says, well, I, you know, I, I've been plumbing my entire life. I feel like at that point it would be 40 years. It just feels right. And I said, what if you retired at 60 and then could you work part time in your job? Could you just work for your current clientele when they clogged up their toilet or their septic tank needed drained? Is that something you can you can do kind of on a part time basis? And he said, well, yeah, I could do that part time. I said, OK, let's look at that. Let's look at you working part time from 60 to 70, just 10 years, and you only have to unclog toilets when you want to, okay? If you don't want to unclog a toilet, you don't want to mess around with some poop, don't do it, okay? <laughs> so let's go to cash flows real quick, and let's put in some part time work. So let's say part time work. Let's start this when he's 60. So we're going to start this, let's say March of 2032, or yeah, 2033. And we'll do this until 2043. And let's just get, let's say you make 20, what do you say? You're at 110 now, part-time work. You don't wanna work that hard. Let's say you make $30,000 a year, okay? So 30,000, divide that by 12, that's $2,500 a month. Okay, 2,500 a month from three of 33 to 43, we'll increase that by just 1% a year. And that's going to come from your work and it's going to go to pay expenses. Okay, so part-time work, unclogging toilets, let's do it. So that's an inflow, 2,500, we're going to start it there. So let's look at this now. So now, you see this? Here's our part-time work coming in. Boom, boom, boom. We're going to get that for 10 years. Okay, $2,500 for 10 years, giving a little bit of a Social Security are giving it a little of a cost of living increase right there. And now we're out of money at 90. I feel a lot better about that. I feel pretty good about getting us to 90 and look at our rate of return. It's down to 5.72, which means now we have less that we have to earn in the market. And I say, hey Jack, how do you feel about that? I feel pretty good. I say, okay, let's look at one more thing. Just, just, just for me, what if you worked for two more years. You didn't retire at 60, you retired at 62. So let's retire you at 62. Okay, Jack, just hang, hang with me. I'm not telling you to work any longer. Just, just hang with me, okay? We're gonna work for two more years. That means our part-time work 
is not going to start until 2035. We're still going to do it to 70, so I'm not going to have you working part-time for 10 years, 62 to 70. Just 62 to 70, okay? But we're going to work for another two years, which means we're going to get another two years of this coming in, okay? What does that do? 94. Get you an extra four years. What do you think about that, Jack? And that's the conversation we have as we're doing the EKG, as we're going through the financial plan, because it's not necessarily a set it and forget it, Pillsbury dough, sprinkle pixie dust, it's gonna work. This is a this is work that we do together. And if you want a financial EKG, go to the description of this video, get in touch with me, let's put one together for you to get you to retirement, to get you through retirement, and protect your ability to stay in retirement. Thank you so much for watching. God bless. Bye-bye.